one of the nice things about talking to a hometown crowd is that um, they probably knew or knew something about John Fetzer. How many people here at least knew about John Fetzer? Anybody? Oh, wow. Okay. Fantastic. Anybody actually know John Fetzer personally? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I never got a chance to meet him. I um, came in 1996 and he died in 1991, so we didn't quite overlap. Yeah, so it's always fun to hear the stories of people who knew him personally. Well, uh, what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about uh, John Fetzer's history, his background, uh, some of his pursuits, what made him so wealthy. And then I'm going to talk about his spiritual quest, which is something most people don't know about. And I didn't know much about until I got down into the archives of the, the Fetzer Institute a couple of years ago. Uh, Western generously gave me a year-long sabbatical, and I basically moved into the Institute and uh, spent that time going through the, the archives, which was just a rich, rich uh, source for John Fetzer. So here's a formal portrait of uh, Johnny Fetzer, lived from 1901 to 1991, pretty well kind of spanned the century. Um, John Fetzer was born in small town Indiana, a little place called Decatur. I don't know if they pronounce it Decatur or Decatur. Decatur, I think. Decatur. And um, he uh, had an interesting kind of small town childhood. Um, his mother was widowed early on, so John Fetzer lost his father when he was a very young boy. And his mother, um, who's on the left there, Della, uh, basically made a living buying up old houses uh, re uh, rehab uh, rehabilitating them, refurbishing them, and then selling them for a profit. So she was essentially flipping houses before flipping houses became a thing. And the problem with that, though, was they, they constantly were moving. Because they'd move into a house, they'd fix it up, and then they'd sell it, and then they would move. So for the first few years of John Fetzer's life, um, he was on the move. Uh, in several little small towns in, in Indiana. And eventually the family wound up uh, in West Lafayette near Purdue University. And so that is the town that John Fetzer himself really see, saw as his hometown. And that was really propitious for a variety of reasons. Um, primarily among them was the fact that very early on, when he was a teen, he got very interested in radio. And this began when he got together with his brother-in-law. So John Fetzer, his brother-in-law, uh, was named Fred Ribble. And Fred Ribble uh, was a telegrapher for the Wabash Railroad. And so uh, John Fetzer, when he was a young kid, uh, was taught uh, Morse code by Fred. And they got very interested in kind of the emerging electronic media of the time. Of course, the you know, the Telegraph had been around for a while, but then they got fascinated by radio, which was just emerging at the time. And one of the things they did together was they, they pulled their pennies and they bought a little crystal radio set. And even when I was a kid, you could still buy these in the back of comic books and they'd send them to you. And they didn't look anything like a radio because it was just a coil and, and probably an earphone and things like that. So very primitive. But um, for John Fetzer, the, it kind of you know, set his destiny at this point because he was absolutely fascinated by the fact that you could build this little machine, tune it in, and then pick up voices and singing and news and baseball games and all these kinds of things right over the air, right out of the air. And for him, uh, radio never lost its magic. You know, he understood the technology of it, but at some level, it stirred in him this idea that there was something beyond that radio was kind of uh, indicative of. It was indicating some larger forces within the universe. And this basically comes to fruition later in life. So he builds this little radio set. Uh, he begins studying uh, radio engineering seriously when he was a teen. Uh, he started attending some classes at Purdue in uh, radio sciences. And at a certain point, the real turning point for John Fetzer came when um, the president, uh, 
of Emmanuel Missionary College, which is uh, the Seventh-day Adventist college that's today Andrews University, came down to visit his mother, his mother Della, who had converted to Seventh-day Adventism. And the president of Emmanuel Missionary College said, we hear that you're a radio whiz, and we'd like you to come up to Emmanuel, and you can get a you know, good four-year liberal arts education, and you can also help us put together the first radio station at Emmanuel Missionary College. And so John Fetzer said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. I can you know, get an education and do what I love, which is working on radios. And for him, it was, this is a picture of his first radio setup that he created in his dorm room at Emmanuel Missionary College. And, but very quickly, the, the, the college um, uh, uh, basically um, supplied the money to build an actual radio station. And it was called WEMC, W Emmanuel Missionary College, the Radio Lighthouse. Because the whole point, of course, was to proselytize the world to the Seventh-day Adventist message. Um, you can't really see it here, but in the original photographs, it's pretty clear. This is John Fetzer standing in front of WEMC with their transmitter. And here he is, uh, dressed up in all his finery. Um, the thing that was really great about Emmanuel Missionary College was that John Fetzer got to do just about everything at a radio station. So he worked on the engineering, he selected the equipment, he did the programming, he put together the, you know, the, the college orchestra to basically play on air. Uh, he also was a presenter, so he was also on-air talent. So he had to do the administrative work, the bookkeeping, all this kind of stuff. And also study and get a degree, which is, I think, quite remarkable. But he managed to, to juggle all these things. And so he basically got in on the ground floor of radio in the best possible way, because he basically was able to do everything at the radio station. And one of the things that, um, one of the best things that happened to him was that he uh, met and fell in love with another student who was uh, part of the orchestra that played for WEMC, uh, Rhea Yeager. And they got married in 1926. Well, John Fetzer uh, eventually graduates from uh, Emmanuel Missionary College. It, it took him actually five years, uh, part of which, part of the reason was that he stopped out and took a trip to Europe. And the trip to Europe was uh, not only kind of the grand tour kind of thing, but also to investigate radio in Europe. And of course, radio in Europe at that time was a little bit more advanced than radio in the United States. So this was a kind of fact-finding tour for him. And he went to a number of cultural sites as well. It was a, a very important experience for him. But that's one of the reasons why it took him five years instead of four years. Uh, but he eventually graduates. And in 1928, he moved to Ann Arbor with the idea that he was going to do graduate work in radio engineering at the University of Michigan. He enrolled in classes. Uh, he was enjoying himself. Uh, and he thought you know, the future was set, that's what he was gonna do, was become a, a, a radio engineer. And at that point, Emanuel Missionary College decided that the radio station was too expensive. And so they were gonna get rid of it. And so they offered Fetzer the license. If he could scrape up, and I, I forget exactly how much he had to scrape up, but it was something like $5,000. For the license, he could buy the license to WEMC and make it his own commercial radio station. And luckily, uh, Rhea Yeager, his wife's parents, loaned him the money because they didn't have that kind of cash at that time. And he bought the, the radio station, the, the, the license, and began broadcasting as WEMC in Berrien Springs. The problem was um, there were all sorts of strings attached. Uh, he couldn't broadcast uh, any advertisements for things like meat or alcohol or tobacco. I guess you couldn't anyway, alcohol, but tobacco you could. Um, there was uh, a ban on any kind of music except kind of orchestral music and, or hymns. 
and definitely no jazz. You cannot broadcast jazz. So he decides, if I'm going to survive, if this radio station is going to survive, we're going to have to leave Berrien Springs and go to a bigger market. And of course, the bigger market is Kalamazoo. And here he comes. He uh, purchases the radio station, $5,000 in 1930, and moves the radio station to Kalamazoo as WKZO in 1931. And of course, WKZO continues on the air to this day. Yeah, still broadcasting. And that was kind of the kernel, the start, of what was to become the Fetzer Broadcasting System. Uh, it's interesting because um, Rhea Fetzer was tremendously important in the, the success of his broadcast business. Um, during the 30s and 40s, well, primarily the 1930s, um, one of the problems with having a radio station in Kalamazoo was the problem of clear air at night. So he could only broadcast during the daylight hours because I don't really understand this, but uh, from, you could tell me what the physics of this is, but at night, I guess there's less of, of ionic so people can broadcast farther with the same power radio stations. So Kalamazoo was stuck in the middle between two powerful radio stations, one in Chicago and one in Buffalo, New York. And so the FCC at that time basically said, you cannot broadcast on the same frequency that's going to interfere with another broadcaster at any time. And during the day, it wasn't a problem. But at night, they did interfere. So he could only broadcast during the day. And of course, that was tremendously limiting for the station. So he got an engineer to um, develop a directional radio transmitter. And it's fascinating, because it, it basically broadcast in this huge kind of figure eight. And so the idea was, you have Buffalo here, you have Chicago here, and he could broadcast right up the middle. But this was new technology, and it took him a while in Washington, DC, to convince the FCC to approve this. So while he's off in Washington trying to get this done, who's back here running WKZO? Rhea Fetzer. Yeah. And at this time, they were housed in the old Burdick Hotel. Yeah. The radio station was there, and they also lived in the hotel. So it was all very convenient. You get up in the morning, and you just go right to the, the radio station. So she's an unsung hero and doesn't probably, probably doesn't get as much credit as she should for the initial success of John Fetzer's broadcasting um, system. Eventually, he branches out. Uh, he buys a radio station in Grand Rapids, and he renames it WJEF, W. Johnny Fetzer. <laughs> and eventually, this becomes uh, an FM radio station. And by the 1960s, apparently, it was the most powerful FM radio station in the world for a time. And so he was a pioneer in FM. And then, of course, in the 1950s, he branched out into television, WKZO. He became a CBS affiliate. Uh, of course, this building is still there. It's now Channel 3 on Maple Street. Uh, and he began building his television empire as well. And he branched out. For example, he had a number of television stations for a time in Nebraska, of all places, uh, which he eventually donated to the University of Nebraska. And it became the, 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 the um, kind of seed for Nebraska public television. Yeah. Um, in addition, he uh, got into recorded music. He had a Muzak franchise. I guess he got in on you know, the ground floor of that, made money at Muzak. Uh, tried to get into television production. That didn't go so well. Um, but uh, he really tried out all sorts of, of different things. Um, by the 1950s, he had uh, become a fairly wealthy man. And he was looking for other opportunities to invest in. And so what does he do? Buys a baseball team. Yeah. Well, he wasn't rich enough at this point to just buy the team outright. He got a consortium of different investors together. And they bid on the team, and they won it. And so in 1956, he purchased the Tigers through his consortium. And then slowly but surely, over the next few years, 
he bought out his partners and became the sole owner of the Detroit Tigers. And he owned the baseball team uh, until the 1980s. And he became very, very strongly identified, for good or for ill, with the Detroit Tigers. Yeah, and he loved it. He just loved the idea. He grew up, once he got into radio, he grew up listening to Detroit Tigers baseball on the radio. So it was almost kind of his hometown team in a way. Yeah. So he sets up his broadcasting empire. He becomes very wealthy. Uh, he buys the Detroit Tigers and manages it for almost 30 years. Um, That's kind of the, the story that most people know about John Fetzer. Um, but I'm a professor of comparative religion. So what is my interest in this? What's, what's the, the rest of the story, as someone used to say? Well, there's a part of Fetzer's life that he kept very quiet about during most of his life. And this was strategic on his part um, because he was afraid that in religiously conservative Southwest Michigan, if people knew that he was uh, very interested in what might be seen as non-mainstream spirituality, he might actually lose audience members and he might lose advertisers. And he was also always worried about maintaining his licenses. So uh, he kept this spiritual side of himself very, very quiet. And it's interesting because a lot of people who worked with him at the broadcasting station or with the Detroit Tigers, they had no idea of these kinds of interests. Um, only his inner circle really understood uh, what he was interested in. Well, the actual spiritual journey of Johnny Fetzer begins with a fairly conventional Christian background. Um, John Fetzer himself was baptized a Methodist went to a Methodist Sunday school. Uh, and then as a teenager, his mother converts to Seventh-day Adventism. And Seventh-day Adventism is uh, an apocalyptic tradition. They're, they're basically looking for the end of the world, coming pretty quickly. Uh, they also practice some interesting um, health precepts, like vegetarianism and things like that. And they are very biblically fundamentalist. So they tend to be very conservative religiously. And for a time, John Fetzer was um, a, 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 a very devout Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, he took the tradition very, very seriously. Uh, his wife was born into a Seventh-day Adventist family. But once he graduated, he began uh, reviewing his, his, his own beliefs. He began analyzing his own beliefs. And he finally decided that he really didn't want to be a Seventh-day Adventist that the spirituality really wasn't his path. So eventually, so he converts to Seventh-day Adventism, but in 1930, he left the Seventh-day Adventist tradition. Yeah. And the interesting thing is he always maintained very good ties with the Seventh-day Adventist even after he left, uh, especially uh, Andrews University, which eventually gave him uh, an honorary degree at some point. And he always said that his, his, his education and his grounding in Seventh-day Adventism was very useful uh, for him in terms of his character development in his, the rest of his life. But the restrictions of a conservative Christian faith just were not for him. He wanted to explore other avenues. So he leaves Seventh-day Adventism in 1930. There we go. And one of the first things he does is he heads south to Indiana to a place called Camp Chesterfield. And Camp Chesterfield, I don't know if you can read it at the bottom here, was founded by the Indiana Association of Spiritualists. So spiritualists, of course, are people who believe that through a medium, a person who is specially constituted, as they think, as they said, uh, could basically contact the spirits of the dead. And through the spirits of the dead, of course, get you know, personal information and things like that, but also spiritual insights. And during the 19th century, spiritualism was one of the fastest growing religious traditions in the United States, especially here in Michigan and in the Midwest generally. Um, Battle Creek was founded by Quakers, but eventually all the Quakers in Battle Creek became spiritualists. Yeah. <laughs> 
And then the Seventh-day Adventists came, and it was a very interesting mix of people. Yeah, that's a different story. <laughs> so spiritualism was very popular in 19th century America. And in fact, there was a longtime spiritualist camp. They would go and hear you know, spiritualist preachings, and they would uh, engage in seances and things like that. Of course, this is a picture of a seance. Um, and uh, these, uh, these camps were run kind of like um, uh, uh, evangelical Christians ran revival meetings, those kinds of things. So you had Methodist camps and Baptist camps, but you also had spiritualist camps. And Three Rivers was uh, a spiritualist camp that lasted into the 20th century. Eventually, it faded away. But by that time, it had actually inspired whoops, Camp Chesterfield. So Indianans who were spiritualists were coming up to Three Rivers to the um, spiritualist camp. And they decided, well, we should just create a spiritualist camp uh, where we are. And so they did. And it became uh, one of the most popular spiritualist destinations in the country. It still is. Yeah. And there are three really strong uh, surviving spiritualist camps. There's one in Lilydale, upstate New York, a really interesting place. Camp Chesterfield and Casadaga in Florida. Yeah. So among people who are spiritualists, Camp Chesterfield still is, uh, is uh, one of the kind of pilgrimage sites, I guess, if, if you want to go. Um, this weekend, we're actually doing a, uh, a talk and a um, book signing down at Camp Chesterfield. So yeah, interesting, interesting place. Well, Fetzer was interested in spiritualism. But Camp Chesterfield was also interested. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was formative for, for Fetzer because it exposed him to an entirely different kind of spirituality. But Camp Chesterfield also had a bookstore. And the bookstore stocked books on all sorts of different things in addition to spiritualism. And Fetzer, who started going in the 1930s, and his last recorded visit was in the early 70s, he said every time he went to Camp Chesterfield, he would go to the bookstore and load up on a pile of books and bring them home. And he built up this very large kind of spiritual library. And a lot of it still exists in the Fetzer Institute archives. Yeah. So what were some of the other things he was interested in? Well, here is just a short list. And I'm not going to go through and explain everything here. The book, I think, uh, uh, explains each one of these in turn. Uh, but he started with spiritualism, and he got interested in new thought, which is the mind over matter tradition that was very popular, still is, in the United States, um, you know, uh, leading to things like Christian science and Norman Vincent Peale, power of positive thinking, that kind of stuff. He uh, became a Freemason in the 1930s and was very interested in the esoteric aspects of Freemasonry. Uh, one of the things I've been doing lately is going around Masonic lodges in Michigan giving this talk. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, he got interested in Hermeticism, Rosicrucianism, Theosophy, which is this interesting mix of Western esoteric thought and Hinduism and Buddhism. And uh, the headquarters for Theosophy in the United States is uh, Wheaton, Illinois, of all places. Yeah, <laughs> just down the street from, uh, from Wheaton College, Billy Graham's old college. Uh, in the 1950s, so he was reading all these things and um, uh, basically incorporating them into a worldview that he was constructing for himself. And in the 1950s, he got very interested. Of course, 1947 was kind of the birth of the UFOs in the United States. And that kind of took off during the 1950s. He was fascinated by the possibility of UFOs. Uh, both from a spiritual standpoint, but also from a technological standpoint. If these things exist, how do they actually work? And if they work, who are they being piloted by? Why are they here? All those he kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> no, no, he was a, a true believer in the reality of UFOs. Uh, he was also very interested in parapsychology, which is the, 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 um, the, um, uh, let's see, how can I put this by kind of split the difference here? Some people say it's a pseudoscience, other people say it's a science, but it has achieved a modicum of academic respectability 
There were, at this time, departments of parapsychology, especially at Duke University. There was a guy named J.B. Ryan who managed to create uh, an institute for the study of the parapsychological. So ESP, precognition, uh, telepathy, uh, telekinesis, uh, all, clairvoyance, you can just keep going on and on. And these were the kinds of things that John Fetzer was absolutely fascinated by. And part of this, again, goes back to his radio experience. Because if there are radio waves shooting through the air, maybe there are other kinds of energies that are out there that aren't empirical in the sense that we can create machines, maybe we can, in order to intercept them. But maybe they're functioning in the world as well. Uh, in the 1970s, he uh, met the Maharishi Yogi and got into transcendental meditation and practiced transcendental meditation for years. Uh, the Maharishi wanted him to uh, uh, basically advise him on how to uh, use television to get his message out. And John Fetzer basically took some instruction from the Maharishi in Transcendental Meditation. And this is one of the cases where he actually, uh, John Fetzer never liked to uh, insert himself in the daily running of his ball team. He was a, a kind of hands-off owner in most cases. But in the 1970s, he decided, well, maybe the ball team could benefit from transcendental meditation. <laughs> so he offered TM classes for uh, the ball team down in Florida when they were in spring training. And uh, a number of the players took it up. And some of them said it was very helpful in getting themselves centered and continued to practice it for um, several years. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the year that he introduced TM to the team, they had a losing season. So the sports writers, of course, had a field day with this. Yeah. And that's exactly the kind of negative publicity that John Fetzer didn't want. So he very rarely actually um, uh, introduced, he never imposed, but introduced his, his spiritual beliefs on the baseball team. He was very interested in channeling, which is uh, this idea that there are certain people who can tune in to higher beings for spiritual insight. He was one of the first adopters of A Course in Miracles, which is now kind of the Bible of the New Age movement. Um, I don't know if anybody's been following the candidacy of Marianne Williamson. Yeah, but she comes out of the A Course in Miracles, um, that kind of group. And then other things like the movement for spiritual inner awareness, et cetera, et cetera. And it just, it goes on. And it's just remarkable the number of different spiritual paths that John Fetzer went down. Well, ultimately, John Fetzer basically created for himself uh, his own spiritual worldview. And it boils down to a metaphysical spirituality, which simply means that he believed in the unity of the universe, all is one. Sometimes it's called cosmological monism. So the spiritual world and the material world are actually all one. And in fact, for John Fetzer, it all basically went back to the spiritual. So everything was interconnected. And everything is interconnected by the circulation of energies of various kinds, either subtle energies, spiritual energies, or physical energies. Uh, he believed in human spiritual evolution. He believed that human beings throughout their lives through spiritual study could achieve higher and higher states of consciousness. Uh, he ultimately believed in the harmony of science and religion. So he felt that true science and true religion would never conflict. This is an old idea, of course. But this was very important for him because on the one hand, he was this engineer. He was into technology. But on the other hand, he had the spiritual side. So he really truly believed that these two things, science and spirituality, ultimately would be harmonized. They'd just be seen as different sides of the same coin. And then finally, he believed in global spiritual transformation. So the idea here is that if enough people achieve higher states of consciousness, then it will catalyze a global transformation. Yeah. And he labeled this the New Age. Yeah. Now, that term, the New Age, had actually been around for a while, but John Fetzer started using it in the 1960s. And that's almost 20 years before it became the New Age movement. 
uh, in the United States. So he was, he was using this term for this global spiritual transformation quite early on. Uh, and hence, that's why I called the book Johnny Fetzer and the Quest for the New Age. So that was tremendously important for him. He felt that individual spiritual development was good, but if it didn't lead to something global, to the renovation of the globe, and you know, almost the salvation of humanity, if you wish, then it was really not on the right path. Now, for me, as an historian, what was great was uh, he wrote about his beliefs in uh, a couple of books. And this is a little bit on the odd side, but um, he was very interested in genealogy. So he wrote a genealogy of his father's family, and then he wrote a genealogy of his mother's family. And at the end of each one of these books, he devoted a couple of chapters to talking about his spiritual beliefs. And so one of these books was published in the 60s. The other was in the early 70s. And so I could compare these and look at where he was going spiritually, what kinds of things he was putting together to create his worldview. Yeah. And eventually, well, the, the, um, the, the Winger genealogy, which is his mother's side, uh, the last few chapters were set aside and called America's Agony, and they were published separately um, by the, the Fetzer Institute a number of years ago as a kind of primer in John Fetzer's spirituality. So for me, this was tremendously useful. Uh, there are other things he did, other writings that he did that allowed me to kind of get into his head, but these were the most useful because they were the most kind of highly developed. Well, in the 1970s, uh, John Fetzer decides that he really wants to start liquidating his businesses. Now, he's in his 70s at this point. And he wants to start liquidating his businesses and start putting money into a foundation to promote his idea of spirituality. So he'd already created something in the 1950s called the John Fetzer Foundation, and, but he'd never actually done much with it. He, it was mainly a conduit for charitable donations to a variety of different things. But in the 70s, he decided he was going to make the foundation his focus. And so slowly but surely, he began laying the groundwork for the liquidation of his broadcasting empire and eventually the sale of the baseball team. And the money he realized on that would get sunk into the foundation. Yeah. So the original idea in the 1970s was a foundation devoted to catalyzing the spiritual transformation of the world. That's that kind of new age focus but also discovering a science of the spirit. And what that meant primarily was uh, parapsychology. So he really wanted the foundation at that point to underwrite academic research in parapsychology. And that's what they did for a time, is they sent money to like J.B. Rhine to underwrite various you know, uh, research programs. Um, he also became very interesting, interested in mind-body healing. Uh, part of this came through his experience with TM, but then he got into biofeedback and things like that. Uh, and in fact, the biofeedback research um, uh, was done partly here at, at Western Michigan University, and it became kind of the, the core of what eventually develops into the holistic health program at Western. Yeah. And then he was very interested in the 1980s in what's called subtle energy medicine. So there's this idea that the human body uh, is basically energized not only by empirical energies, but also subtle energies. So I don't know if anybody has heard about this idea of the human body having an aura of subtle energies. And the idea was that there are certain people who can see these auras and based on the way they appear can diagnose and treat disease. So his idea was, well, if that's the case, we should be able to come up with machines to do it as well. So he actually poured a fair amount of money into this kind of research uh, in the 1980s. Well, and this is the old logo of the Johnny Fetzer Foundation. Um, the other thing he did in the 1980s was he decided that the Fetzer Foundation, if it were to survive, and he envisioned a 500-year mission for the, for the foundation. If it were to survive, uh, 
it would need uh, a headquarters. And because at that time, he was actually running the foundation out of an office building or an office space he was renting at the, the high-rise apartments over here. Is it the Sky View? Sky, sky Rise. Yeah. So he had, he had an office there. Um, but it really wasn't big enough, and he didn't have a big enough staff to do what he wanted. So he um, contracted with an uh, architectural firm called Hepi uh, out of Detroit to design a building to house his foundation. And he wanted the building to express some of his spiritual ideas. So for example, the original idea was he, he wanted a, a pyramid. He was very interested in things Egyptian. And this fits into this whole idea of subtle energies as well. Uh, but Hepi basically said, well, the, a pyramid isn't the most efficient use of space, so how about a triangle? And it cuts a very distinctive kind of profile seen from the air. And he loved this idea. And in fact, he really, the triangle for him uh, symbolizes mind, body, and spirit. Yeah. And then the building itself is filled with all sorts of interesting spiritual and esoteric symbols. Um, on the foyer here, there's a beautiful carving in rose marble of a, a winged solar disk from Egyptian mythology. And as you go out the back door, which is actually the employee's entrance, there are other carvings of Isis and Nephthys, which are two goddesses from the Egyptian pantheon which were actually copied from the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun. So some interesting, interesting symbolic uh, aspects of this building. There are a lot of crystals in the building because, again, he's very interested in the use of crystals for the channeling of subtle energies. There's a meditation room. And to this day, there's a gong that rings at 2 in the afternoon. And those who want to can retire to the meditation room for some mindfulness exercise. Yeah? Yeah. This, the building, uh, thank you for asking. Yeah, it's out on KL Avenue. It's out in Oshtabo. Uh, there's a Dustin Lake, and he bought up, uh, I forget exactly how big the campus is now, um, but a lot of property around the lake. And since that time, they've actually bought out people, homeowners who have uh, sold their homes. So it's, it's expanding. You can see the lake over here. Yeah. Uh, and they built this beautiful, campus. If you go out there now, the building itself is not open to the public except for occasional tours. Uh, but the grounds you can go to. And there are trails. And it's a, it's a really beautiful kind of wooded area. Yeah, it's set back from the road. You wouldn't know it was there unless you were looking for it. It's on KL Avenue on the right-hand side. And there's a little, little uh, black obelisk that basically says the Fetzer Institute. Um, one of the more interesting uh, aspects of this, I think it's interesting, is that Hepi decided this was a building that should really be seen from a god's eye view. It's really a building that was built to be seen from the air. And one of the things they did not want to do was to build the HVAC equipment onto the top of the building. So notice it's, it's blank. Yeah. Um, but the problem is then, OK, what do you do with it? Where do you put it? Well, they decided that they were going to put it, I don't know if you can see this, but there is a little obelisk mm -hmm. out here. And actually, let me, this is uh, a more contemporary photograph of it. And you can see the obelisk here. It actually turned out to be black instead of white. And what that does is it basically disguises the HVAC equipment for the building. But they decided they weren't just going to you know, build a box out there. So they, they gave Fetzer his pyramid of a kind by making it into an obelisk. And if you go out there, you'll notice that the top of the obelisk, there's an Encore article about the Fetzer Institute that came out last year that shows it very nicely. There are two open circles at the top. And the idea was that on Fetzer's birthday, when the first rays of the sun come up, they go through the obelisk. And they'll hit a little copper dot on the side of the building. Yeah, just in homage to. Fetzer and his belief in the power of subtle energies, in this case, the sunlight. So that was uh, built in the 1980s, and it was opened uh, for occupation in 1987. And it's been the, the Fetzer Foundation's um, uh, location since then. 
Just before John Fetzer died, he passed away in 1991. They decided for a variety of reasons to change the name from Fetzer Foundation to Fetzer Institute. So now it's known officially as the Fetzer Institute. Um, in the last uh, few months of his life, um, John Fetzer and his, he, uh, he had a number of caretakers who worked with him. They decided that if he stayed in Kalamazoo for another winter, it would kill him. <laughs> and I, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so he decided the, the foundation, he had liquidated his businesses, he'd sold everything off, he'd sold the ball team, he'd made a fortune on the ball team. Uh, bought it for five million, sold it for 50 million. So pretty good investment. Uh, he had uh, created this huge endowment for the Fetzer Institute. It was, it was off and running, it had a full staff. Uh, it was running programs and he felt comfortable enough to finally leave the area. So he moved to Hawaii. And so the last few months of his life, uh, he lived a kind of secluded existence in Hawaii. Uh, and um, finally passed away in 1991, just shy of his 90th birthday. Yeah. Since that time, the Fetzer Institute uh, continues, of course, to operate and to thrive. Um, its mission has changed over the years. Um, after Fetzer's death, they basically de-emphasized the parapsychological stuff and the energy medicine stuff. And they got into programs having to do with mind-body health. Uh, one of the things they did was they underwrote a program uh, for Bill Moyers uh, that aired on PBS that was essentially a series of programs on the varieties of mind-body health. And in fact, there's an episode on acupuncture, and for a lot of people, that was the first time they'd ever actually seen acupuncture. So there was a book project, and there was a, the, the, the program, television program, that came out, and that was underwritten by the Fetzer Institute. And they did a variety of different other programs as well. Um, after 9-11, the, the mission of the, the Fetzer Institute uh, evolved a little bit more. And today, the mission is helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. And so the idea is that in the face of just this intractable conflict around the world, that a more spiritual approach, hopefully, will hopefully lead to um, more peace and tranquility on Earth and uh, openness to uh, spiritual development for both for individuals and hopefully for that hope for global spiritual transformation. So at this point, um, if you want to find out more about the Fetzer Institute and its, uh, its programs, you can go to www.fetzer.org. And they have a very nice website that talks about the programs they're doing today. One of the programs that I find absolutely fascinating is it's called uh, the Democracy Project. Uh, it was originally called, I think, Healing the Heart of Democracy. Uh, and the whole idea there was to create small groups of people, bringing together people from both sides of the political divide to talk about not their political differences, but kind of the spiritual underpinnings of democracy itself. And hopefully through those kinds of conversations, maybe, hopefully, move people a little bit closer to some kind of engagement. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, it just started a couple years ago, and it's, it's a very interesting program. Um, something you might notice on the radio is that, how many people here have listened to Krista Tippett's program on being? Yeah, that's also partially underwritten by the Fetzer Institute, yeah. So these are the kinds of things that they've been doing. Well, I think that's enough. Thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.